Good afternoon and welcome to the AGO. I'm Stefan Yost, the Michael and Sonia Kerner Director and CEO of the Art Gallery of Ontario. And this afternoon I'm joined by Kaywin Feldman, who's Director of the United States National Gallery in Washington, DC. We'd like to begin these events by acknowledging that we're on the traditional territory of the Mississauga of the New Credit, which has also been home to the Huron, Wenda, and Haudenosaunee people through time. I'm glad that you all had a chance to join us. We have about a thousand people that have signed in, so thank you and welcome back. Um, over the next couple of weeks, we've got great people coming on. Uh, Ann Pasternak, Matthew Teitelbaum, and others will be joining us at ago.ca. It's a very active website, and it's not just museum directors. Uh, we have a lot of different kinds of people coming. Indeed, I think on Tuesday, the 19th, that's this coming Tuesday at two o'clock, we've got the Scottish mystery novelist, Ian Rankin, joining Heidi Reitmeister for a, for a Zoom conversation. So come back to our website and look at it. There's a lot to do. Um, as this is Zoom, uh, you're welcome to ask questions. The format here with Kaywin is pretty straightforward. We'll chat for about 25 minutes or so. And Kathleen, who's on our team, and Annie, who's on our team behind the scenes, will be taking your questions and then sending them to me in a chat thing. And then we'll chat for about 10 minutes. So welcome, uh, Kaywin, to the AGO and through Toronto. Um, I'm going to just offer, ask a really broad question. What's on your top of mind today? What are you thinking about today? Well, as you might recall, when you kindly invited me to join you, the first thing I said was how annoyed I was to be doing it by Zoom because I love Toronto and um, it's such a great city, great community, lively, active, interesting, international with um, fabulous museums. So uh, it's, thank you for It's a the great invitation. place to call home, but I've got to say your spring is, comes a lot earlier than ours. The Forsythia are out right now. <laughs> so. Well, we hope when the borders open, you'll be able to. We've already had cherry blossoms. Oh, yeah. We're, we're, yes. we're, we're just at that point. I'll be now, back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You've been now how long at the National yeah. Gallery? And when I'm not thinking about Toronto, um, just over a year. Just over a year. A year and two months. Okay, congratulations. Yeah. In fact, we, yeah, we closed two days after um, I celebrated my first year. Wow. Okay. It's, so, um, yeah. It's one heck of uh, and way before to... that, I was at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Yes. So Kaywin was a legendary director at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, which, if you haven't been to, is one of the truly great encyclopedic museums and one of the great communities also, um, with the walker is there as well. How long were you at Minneapolis? 11 years. 11 years. Um, yeah. Looking back now. Or 12 winters. 12 winters. <laughs> That's a lot of gold stars there for, for doing that. What, what are you most proud of, of your time looking back at, at those, those 11 years? I think um, really engaging with the community. Um, we, um, the team worked really, really hard to think about um, how we might serve the community. Um, Minneapolis is one of those cities that doesn't get that many tourists, especially between November and May uh, due to the weather. So um, we develop, developed a lot of great partnerships with different organizations in the community and um, over the period of my tenure, the attendance doubled. And I feel like a lot of that was because the uh, programming was so responsive uh, to community interests and um, did some great exhibitions and acquisitions. I, I loved my time there. How did, how did what you did there prepare you for this, this job as head of the National Gallery? You know, it's so interesting because um, when I was thinking about the opportunity of the National Gallery, I actually, I, I um, was sort of worried because uh, this, is, this is the fourth museum that I've run and all the other three museums were very much community museums where the heart of the community was the base of the attendance of the institution. And of course, the National Gallery of Art serves the nation and um, we have such a large tourist population at the gallery. And I said to one of my um, mentors that it was just giving me pause about would it feed my soul to work for a museum that wasn't so firmly based in community like the others. And his eyes lit up and he said, ah, but the nation becomes your community. And what yeah. does that mean? And that yeah. really got me excited. I thought yeah, he was yeah, right. Yeah. So, um, and we're working on a strategic plan right now with the gallery. And um, you know, really, I, I said to the staff, I think we have a really healthy tension between um, what does it mean to be national and how are we serving the nation? And we are also local. We do have this fantastic, dynamic, diverse community all around us. And we also, you know, are committed to serving them. And so 
figuring out what that balance is and, and what programming looks like um, when you have both audiences. And of course, um, we're expecting not to have as many tourists over the next, say, yeah. two years um, because of this moment in time. And so perhaps that gives us uh, a great, even greater opportunity to dive deep into uh, the neighborhood. I've been thinking that in some ways, museums like Toledo, Ohio, who receive very, very few tourism tourists are actually well positioned for the recovery because they are already so deeply community based, right? And I, my hope is, is that for the more national yep, museums, that's right. it'll change their lens a little bit um, and maybe move, show more of the local, right? Yeah. Um, you also spent time in California. Yeah. And I've are never, you thinking differently about your audience now? Uh, yeah, we are. Um, first of all, just the, the speed in which things have moved online and kind of that hybrid uh, online, in person, and that those are mutually reinforcing. They're not, they're not conflicts with each other, uh, conflicted with each other, but that really works in concert together, I think. Um, you know, our community is so diverse, um, and I think we're doing an extraordinarily good job, but every day I feel like I'm failing because there's so much more to do, right? That, that there's, it, it, it's, it's just like, yeah, we, we haven't really done a lot of engagement with the Uzbeki community, you know, and there are a lot of people from Uzbekistan here, you know, so those are the kind of things where I really, um, uh -huh. yeah, I, I think about a lot. Um, I, I hope that's not lost in this kind of period that, that kind of, yeah. um, we've taken a strategy of really engaging kind of more uh, by age. So we're free under 25 and we have this annual pass, which, allows anybody to join the museum for a year for $35, free in and out kind of for a year. And that's really skewed uh, the audience very young and very diverse. So um, focusing on age has actually resulted in a greater diversity than focusing explicitly on, on the diversity itself. Um, so mm -hmm. that's been kind of, kind of okay, I've, I've got a comment on your bookshelf. I think everybody's watching <laughs> and seeing your bookshelf. It, it seems to go on forever. I have this Im image that it goes on for another 50 feet. Um, tell me about you and your husband's relationship it, with books. There's another 10 of them around as well. That's just the one aspect. Um, yeah, we have a uh, 10, we estimate 10,000 volume book collection, um, which I had to declare during my interviews at the National Gallery in terms of considerations of me moving to Washington. Um, it actually makes us hard to find a place to live. We don't have children, so we don't have to navigate schools and bedrooms and that sort of thing. Uh, but we have to figure out load bearing um, floors that can wow. handle uh, 10,000 books. But we come usually with our own um, bookshelves, so we're easy to move. Got it. Heavy, and, but easy. And you just move the whole books with the books in the bookshelf, or do you have to unpack them all, pack them up? And then no, it's, it's really, um, uh, really depressing. Uh, my husband calls it the blender version of book packing. So the movers, you know, they need four big books and they put them in and they need two small ones over oh. here and four medium. And so we open them up and you don't know what you're going to find. So um, it, it's, it's scattered. And do you buy mostly in shops or do you buy online? Um, gosh. A uh, whole range of things, actually. And um, I'm very proud to say that over the years, I've been one of the very best customers of the National Gallery of Art book shop. Oh, yeah. We have an excellent bookshop. And um, I've been shipping from there for, for years. For so, uh, yeah. And what makes a great bookshop in your, in your mind? Um, you know, a great, a great art section, of course, okay. yes. uh, to find some um, treasures that I don't already have. Um, uh, a cat, got to have a good cat yeah. in yeah, any that's, that's... Um, uh, bookshop. Uh, and of course, it's always nice to find a local flair. So uh, I always like bookshops in New Orleans where you oh, find yeah, yeah, yeah. a whole section about all of the great history and architecture and quirkiness of, of yeah. New Orleans. Uh, so, yeah. I, th I think the best art section um, was a bookshop in Santa Monica that I once went to. It was just, I don't know what it was called, but it was like, wow, can I just William, buy up? William Stout. William Stout. Okay. That, that, that was a, a, pretty, a pretty great thing. So tell me yeah. about um, what you're thinking with the National Gallery, uh, directions you're thinking about pulling, pulling things in. Um, kind of yeah. So, um, um, you know, you asked me at the beginning what, I was thinking about today, and um, I think like you and um, all of our colleagues, you know, we're just 
thinking a lot now about when we'll be able to reopen and thinking about the timing of that. Um, the mayor of Washington, D.C. Um, extended our uh, shelter in place order till um, June 8th. So we're sort of thinking now we're looking at July, early July as a, as a reopening period. We have a fantastic sculpture garden right next oh, yeah. to the National Gallery. Um, uh, this part of the gallery. And so we're excited about thinking about opening that first and giving people the opportunity to be outside and, and um, enjoy the, the garden and the sculpture. So thinking about that. And, um, and of course, uh, like all of us thinking about an uh, ever moving exhibition schedule and um, yeah. trying to move those chess pieces around. Um, while the, the last thing I'll say is um, we're also working on a strategic plan and which we were probably 60% of the way through before COVID. And of course, everything has to change now. I mean, a lot of the big picture strategy um, still works, but the phasing and timing and all that sort of thing is, is different. So we're trying to pivot and um, be responsive to the time. We were, we, you know, in our plan, we were talking about kind of online engagement, et cetera important but not front burner and suddenly you're like okay that's that's let's go for it that's the that's that's what we're doing right now um, yeah yeah uh what exhibitions do you yeah. think are, yeah. we're gonna yeah. you're gonna be um uh, that are coming up that you're really passionate or excited about seeing yeah um we uh were supposed to open last week a big exhibition about the baroque era in genoa okay and uh it's the first exhibition ever like it here in the united states there have only been a couple um ever in the past and um so you know one of those moments to bring works of art that are um fantastic but actually um quite unknown to the general public so um we're uh working with a roman partner on that show so hopefully that will we had to um, reschedule it for another year. And, um, and then next month, we were going to open a major Philip Guston exhibition. Uh, yeah. So that one, again, we're um, delaying a bit. Um, so uh, Philip yeah. Guston is such the painter's painter. I mean, yes. so many yes. artists just love his work. Kind of, uh, and uh, I, I love his, his sense of humor, too. It's, it's, Definitely. Yes. Yes. What were some of the kind of values you prioritized in your strategic plan where you said, okay, this is what I really care about and how has COVID focused or unfocused or shifted those values? Yeah, you know, actually, um, I, I sort of, I wrote a message to the staff and I said that it's been a time to think about what is the National Gallery without the National Gallery. And we've been able to take a lot of the value um, discussions that we've had and uh, mission vision as well and think about um, sort of taking them for a test drive during this time and um, we've been thinking in our mission of moving from one of those, des those descriptive missions of we're here to exhibit art and conserve and display and yeah. interpret to a bit more about um, you know welcoming all people so that they can experience um, works of art and um, creativity and um, feel united um, with the rest of, of humanity. So moving to that, more in that model and watching how um, people have gravitated online to all of the great programming that you and our colleagues are doing, uh, whether it's um, lesson plans for children, um, lectures, um, uh, film programs, all the different ways that we're engaging. And I think uh, it really shows the um, importance of coming together, of understanding shared yep. humanity, um, and of um, experience. And um, and in terms of thinking about the institution's values, we did a, uh, a survey and of of the staff, and um, we had about um, 600 employees responded to the survey. So, um, you know, 60% of our staff and um, they were quite you know consistent in in their perspective and uh diversity equity inclusion came out as the you know, number one um value that the gallery really cared about at this time um and of course that um continues um we're also thinking a lot about how to um uh foster a greater um curiosity about our collections and, yeah. and history and culture and the work that we do and um because your collecting mandate historically has been very much European kind of 
art, right? Focus on that. And American? European and, and American. And um, it's, it's interesting when we uh, built the East Building in, in 1978, we, you know, sort of put our toe in the water to say that we were going to now move towards modern and contemporary art as well. And um, at, at initially, we said an artist had to have been um, dead for 15 years before mm -hmm. we would acquire their work for the permanent collection. And then Picasso lived forever. He just wouldn't die. And so <laughs> we, couldn't, we couldn't continue. Somebody offered us great Picasso paintings and we couldn't say no and we couldn't have this restriction. So we actually opened it up now to say that we open, that we collect um, modern and contemporary art uh, without restrictions. So, but, but all European and American in the old masters and then a more global in modern and contemporary art. Right. Right. That makes sense. Um, it's, it's interesting where kind of previous restrictions um, on, or narrowing focus on what you collect on your mandate, um, how that, that can very quickly come into conflict with the need for greater diversity and reflecting kind of a, you've been a big champion of, of women and women artists. Um, uh, how are you going to kind of, because I wouldn't say historically the National Gallery is a leader in that area. How, how, uh, how, do, you, how do you hope to change that a bit? Yeah, I, I'm actually thrilled to say that um, our, our curators and our team at the gallery is really excited about um, moving forward and um, acquiring more works by women artists. And um, a, a group came together shortly after I arrived and noted that they would like to mark the moment of the um, uh, women's right to vote and you know, use that moment to think about our collection and um, uh, really look critically about uh, the number of works by women artists and in which categories and areas. So we're actually planning an exhibition, which we hope will happen um, late fall, um, that's looking at um, women, the works by, by women in the permanent collection, looking at it by decade of our collecting history and, uh, and to be honest about, you know, where the gaps are and um, uh, in thinking about, about the future. Yeah, yeah, because it's, um, it, it's important and it just shows a more accurate view um, of, of what actually, um, uh, you know, often I think that, that um, there are artists who are under-recognized and, um, and then, you know, usually a curator or a director or a collector or somebody gets behind that artist and, and they were always great all along the artist, but that the art world and the public hasn't seen their work or recognized. So I always like to ask, what are, who are some underrecognized artists who do you think um, we should be all paying attention to because they're great? Do you, do yeah, you have... um, of course there are so many. So yeah. um, lots, lots of opportunity <laughs> there. Um, since we're just talking about um, women artists, I'll mention the sort of American surrealist artist, Sylvia Fine. Huh. Um, who I was not familiar with and just before I left Minneapolis, our curator um, there, a um, man named Bob Cozzolino, sort of styles himself as the champion of the um, forgotten um, and unknown artists and um, he brought um, fine to my attention and the museum acquired her work and, and since then, you know, she's been on my radar and so yeah. I've been watching her. Um, I would also add Martin Wong, another American oh, yeah. really um, like painter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Chinese American um, died around um, 1999, I think. Um, I knew his work when, way back when. I, uh, in, when I was in my 20s, I was involved in New York in the AIDS activist scene, and and he was one of the artists who was kind of key to that that conversation. Yeah. Um, good painter, really good painter. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think undervalued. I mean, really um, yeah. underrepresented. Yeah, I, there's a gallery in New York, PPOW, who um, regularly has has artists who they stand by for many, many years. And, and often it turns out they're right. You know, it's just, you know, which yeah. galleries do you enjoy, go, enjoy going to? If you go to New York or wherever, which galleries do you say, yeah, I, I want to go, I go there to see that. Shed a tear as I think about those days. Of yeah, exactly. New York and, and looking at galleries. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I run the gamut because my um, training, I did, my uh, first degree is in uh, Greek and Roman archaeology. Yeah. And then I did all my graduate work in Dutch and Flemish 17th century painting. Yeah. So I always say that old masters are home for me. It's just yeah. that, you know, feels like 
it's it's the comfortable spot. Um, but I also um, love modern and contemporary art as well. So um, I tend to kind of cover that that gamut. Yeah, I'm always amazed at how many museum directors are. As somebody once said, very promiscuous in their taste. They, you know, love decorative arts and Greek and Roman and contemporary art. And I think it's one of those I actually, I think it's part of being a museum director because you do have to love all your children. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that you've, um, any, any great museum director is absolutely passionate about their collections and it doesn't matter exactly um, what the area is. Yeah. And so having both that interest and passion, but the curiosity as well. I and mean, I'm sure like you, I feel that um, I get such a gift that with all of these exhibitions that we do, I get to learn every single time, um, often about a new area. And so it's just an excuse to take a deep dive um, yeah. and, and learn. So what a, how lucky are we? I, I remember going to Honolulu and, and really having almost no knowledge of Asian art or and it's such a huge topic. And, and I, I, I've got to say, I, I love that feeling of not knowing, like when you're just like, I have no idea. I'm, I'm excited to learn. And, you know, five years later, you're going to know a little bit, um, you know, enough to yeah. kind of make your way around. And then coming to Canada, uh, I, there was an artist named Tim Pitsilak, who's from the far north, an Inuit artist. And I remember seeing a drawing by him and having no idea what I was looking at. It was, you know, six by four foot drawing in colored pencil, pencil crayon. Um, had no idea where it was from or what it was. And it was kind of thrilling to kind of go, oh, there's, there's things I really don't know. And, you know, yeah, that's, that's, um, I remember uh, talking to the um, curator who did an exhibition about the um, Wiener Werkstatt designer, um, Dagobert Pekka. Yeah. And, um, and he talked about this exhibition and in my head was playing um, the tape of, oh, I, I hated that show and I don't like his work. And, and the curator said, you know, I knew Pekka's work and I never liked it. And so I knew I had to do an exhibition yes. so that I could conquer it, so that yeah. I could, you know, really know it enough that I could then like it. Yes. And I thought, aren't you a better person than I am? Because I just wrote him off instead of, you know, doing a three-year exhibition on, on the project. So a, a true um, confession yeah. is when I, I, a long time ago, worked at Oberlin College and they have a fantastic collection. It's a small liberal arts school with an amazing collection in Ohio. And they have a Barnett Newman one mint uh, from 1949. It's a black painting with a white stripe. And honestly, mm, not my thing. And so I actually put it in my office because I could, it wasn't on view. Um, and like three weeks later, I'm like, this has got to be on view. It's that good. <laughs> I totally fell in love with it. Now, now I'm a massive Barnett Newman fan, but I, um, but I, I didn't get it. I, I was approaching it too much at, from the art history. It's like, okay, I understand it, but I, I, it didn't resonate with me. Um, but often when I hate something, it's a good sign. There's, it's when yeah, I'm ambivalent yeah. and I'm like, you know, that's when, I, that's when I'm not so sure. Um, tell yeah. me a little bit about what surprised you in a positive way about the National Gallery. What, what did you, when you got there, what did you just say, wow, this is amazing? You know, the, um... Of course, the collection is a gift that keeps on giving, and so being able to really dive deep and and while you have, I've been you know going for so many years, and I I had um, some familiarity with the paintings and sculptures that are on view, um, spending time with the uh, old master print curators, um, looking at our old master drawings that you don't normally see, that was astonishing. And then something else that I would mention um, is the you know gallery has all of the trappings of your traditional um noble temple edifice you know we it, it's a beautiful um temple building um, the the west building of um, tennessee marble and as you walk in the doors you know there's that huge rotunda with a fountain and we have um the most beautiful gardens sprinkled throughout the gallery and the sort of you know grandeur and um, after um, reading a lot about the history of the gallery, about the generosity of the Mellon family and, um, and being there, one of the things that I realized is that um, uh, Andrew Mellon in creating um, this institution, because uh, he, he was the sort of singular force behind it, that um, while some might look at it and think it's elitist, 
I actually think um, that Malin believes so profoundly that every human being has the dignity and deserves to experience that grandeur. Yeah. And so the fact that, you know, we're free admission, um, we don't charge for anything. So you no know, exhibitions, concerts, films, lectures, we, we don't charge for anything. We don't have ticketed galas. It is all there open, except for right now, um, 363 days a year, free for everyone. And that generosity and belief in um, the uh, power of the, um, of the human experience, I, I find um, really impactful. You, you, you get millions of visitors. What's your attendance figure about? Four million, three million? Uh, uh, between four and five. Before, okay. Yeah. 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 Now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now it's like, oh, this will be the. Now I'm running back and forth yeah. in front of the counter as fast yeah. as I can to try to get. I also some... they, my in graduate school. I spent a year um, working with uh, somebody who's become a curator now at the National Gallery, Jonathan Bober. So I, I oh. he's a curator of prints and drawings, and I, I believe that. And so I spent a year. Yes. Um, learning an immense amount. He's a compulsive teacher, and and in the best kind of way. So you know when I see. When I he see is. an old master print, yes. I, uh, yeah, I always have his voice like, is that really good enough? <laughs> you know, is that really an amazing, amazing thing? We have some questions here. And that Genoa, Go on, the Genoa exhibition I mentioned um, was uh, Jonathan's. Ah, yeah, yeah. No, it doesn't make sense. He's, he's yeah. um, always trying to broaden people's understanding of, of Italian art in particular um, beyond just the top three or four artists. Um, and I remember looking at Italian printmaking. It's very different than Northern printmaking but it has a certain kind of freeness and lightness that is spectacular. We have some questions here. Um, does the National Gallery collection include any Canadian artists um, or any indigenous artists who, who are from this area? Oof. Um, I'm sure there are artists with uh, Canadian connections and let's Agnes think Martin. about it. In, do, do you have Agnes yeah. Martin? Yes, yes. Yes. There we go. Okay. Yeah, and I wonder if we have, uh, Janet Cardiff. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we do. I'm Google quickly. Uh, not coming to mind. <laughs> I'm going to be in trouble with our curators tomorrow. They're going to say. Let's see. Who do you have? Uh, why don't you keep asking okay. and I will. Well, uh, the the other question here that comes up is about indigenous artists. Um, the AGO's collection is changing, um, kind of not slowly, but pretty systematically in terms of being much more inclusive and broad, particularly of contemporary indigenous art. Uh, I know you, you belong to a museum ecosystem. Have you guys, do you have a strategy kind of to, to collect indigenous art or contemporary indigenous art? Yeah, I mean, that's actually, um, and I'm familiar with the, the great work that you've, you've done at the AGO. Um, it's a new area for us, and um, uh, we, uh, when I arrived, had a few works by Native American artists in the collection, mostly, or entirely works on paper, and um, when I started bringing it up, several people said, oh, well, wait, we have the Museum of the American Indian across the street, so that's what they do, yeah. and, um, and, you know, through the Smithsonian system, we have um, so much um, compartmentalization of um, collections, uh, but I would respond that if we collect and show American art, we need to show work by Native American artists. Yeah. So um, I'm very proud to say we acquired our first major work by a Native American um, woman artist uh, just a couple of months ago, right. a, a beautiful um, uh, mixed media work by John Quick to see Smith um, from the year 2000. Um, so we're, it's a new area for us. And, and we've made We've made some progress. Um, mostly Wanda and Georgiana have been driving that with kind of support of our chief curator myself, but, but, but we still have a lot, lot of work to do. I mean, it's, um, we don't have really in-depth expertise in Inuit art, for example. Um, and um, we've got extraordinary collections, um, but, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, there's some knowledge, but, but not, not, not kind of like among the deepest of any organization, we should. so. Um, I think we're off to the right track, but, um, and it's an exciting field. It's just, it's, um, it's a global conversation as well, which, uh -huh. yeah. Um, 
tell me what your, um, let's say, experience, how are things change, how are your audiences adapting to COVID, the distance learning, and what do you think will change when you re, what, what, what are we going to learn from this period? So in four years or six years, we'll still have that learning in our organization. Well, certainly I agree agree with all of your earlier comments about digital and um, you know I think we're all recognizing that in the past we saw our real work as being in the galleries um, and in, in our in our physical building and um, and the digital was initially something we had to do and then it was sort of the cherry or the way to get people to find directions to our museums and I, I think that we're coming out of this realizing that it, it's a yes and the digital yeah. will be such an important part of our work going forward. So um, I think that's something that's going to be lasting. Um, I do also think that uh, as related to our earlier conversation that uh, a greater focus on local audiences for all of us uh, is I think uh, going to be something that we will want to continue longer into the future and um, is a you know, positive direction. Uh, and then um, lastly, you know, I'm so new to the National Gallery that um, we're still thinking about um, sort of the future directions we want to go in. Yeah. But having had so many exhibitions um, postponed and moved away, I actually find exciting as a moment to maybe focus more on our permanent collection and think about the installations, um, interpretation, um, trying to do some maybe experimental installations here and there. So it sort of gives some license to try some new things with the collection. I have a very thoughtful question here. How can art institutions um, basically um, address the sense of grief that people are experiencing with, with all the losses kind of um, so many different levels of losses because of COVID. Yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm sure um, that Stephanie, you also remember the um, great role that museums had after 9-11 yeah. as people came to um, find solace and quiet and comfort and that sort of thing. And so um, I, I think that our, um, our public will be able to come and access, we're all feeling all kinds of emotions. And so I think it's one of the beauties of, a, of an art museum is that it's sort of all there under one roof. So if you're feeling um, like you want the solace part, you can do that. If you want some activity and energy and excitement, you can do that. Um, if you want to think about um, pandemics in the past, uh, should anybody want to do that? Our Italian galleries at, at the um, National Gallery have lots of works that were created during those times. So, um, uh, I, I think that the, the beauty is that people can tap into all sorts of emotional yeah. responses. Um, the, the part that worries me, and um, uh, you might, we sort of talked about this a bit um, on our um, group meeting um, last week of, of international museums, is um, the, the, the inability to come together in a close way. And, you know, studies always show that one of the primary reasons people go to museums is because it's a social experience. Yeah, they yeah. come with somebody else and they want to see other people. And um, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to adjust to the idea of our galleries all being so partially empty and um, people all with masks and um, perhaps um, great hesitation and, um, but you know, we'll, we'll get used to it. So yeah. it's, it's just going to be a, Sort of tempering on I, I think people will really enjoy coming back to museums um, and luckily we can do time ticketing and things like that to ensure people's safety but just to be in a civic space again I think will be exhilarating I, I, yeah. I really do yeah. I, I so look forward to um, having the audiences back in our gallery it's just I think it's I think the power of art can be incredibly meaningful and powerful um, Stefan I can't Stan not knowing the answer, so I texted a curator because okay. what better way? And um, she says, um, top of my head, we have four Jack Bush paintings. I'll Great. look for more. Okay, so, all right. <laughs> if you ever want to do a Jack Bush show, we can help. We've got extraordinary okay. collections. So yeah, okay. no, it's, um, there's a lot of cross-cultural, cross-dialogue kind of it. So, um, so what I, I really want to do is thank you for your time. Um, and um, what we're going to do now is we're, I hope that people um, 
come back next week and the week after again on Tuesday, Ian Rankin, the Scottish mystery novelist will be talking. We're, we hope to be a platform not only for our museum directors, but also for other folks. Um, I also am pleased that after this, um, we're gonna be, uh, Kaywin and I are gonna be talking to the Women's Art Initiative. Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a group of supporters um, and uh, of, of the AGO and their uh, generosity goes to support exhibitions of women artists, acquisitions and publications. So last year, for example, they supported the big McLean Thomas show. Um, so it's a group of women who've organized to make sure that um, our, our program is, has, is well funded and also has more um, gender equity. If you want to know more about the Women's Art Initiative, it's a great group. Um, just go to ago.ca and we can find you some information. So with that, I want to thank you very much and thank you all for joining us. Um, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.